Good morning and welcome. And welcome to our friends on Zoom, uh, letting you know that the Christmas Eve service at Saturday at seven o'clock will be on Zoom also. So we hope to have you join us. Uh, for announcements. <clears throat> 
that number one, and I don't know where it is. Uh, first of all, there are the uh, any giving that you want to have for this year must be to Dennis before noon on Thursday, December 29th. The food shelf needs always present are listed. Remember them. A Christmas joy offering, the envelopes. The Christmas joy offering is one of the Presbyterian offerings and it's shared between uh, Presbyterian racial ethnic schools and the um, board assistance program of the Board of Pensions, our retired pastors and church people. Uh, today is for our birthdays. Steve Hodges' birthday is here today. Uh, Tuesday is Rebecca Reshes. Wednesday, Jenna Alvarez. Friday, Caitlin Maybon. And next Sunday, Ann Wallace, our Christmas baby. Uh, deacons have a message. Barb? Good morning, everyone. Every year, the deacons talk about recognizing one of you who do things constantly throughout the year with no glory, just doing it because of your love for OPC. And every year we like to recognize who we call a silent angel. And this year's silent angel is Susie Ewell, who provides us with lovely flowers throughout the growing season. So Susie, know that your work is appreciated, your love and devotion to this church you are so loved. Thank you, Barb. And we want to welcome uh, Joanna, who's Ellen's daughter, who will do our chimes and the prelude.
all of you French scholars got that, but I made sure I would promise Ellen that I would tell you that the French means he is born the holy child, the holy infant. And that's why we're here. That's where all of these lights are leading. We're leading toward Bethlehem and to the coming of Christ. The season, the season of God's grace is dawning. And the light shines. <laughs> and no one is going to blow it out. <laughs> Some lights are more stubborn than others. Let me help you. Sure. Okay. Let's get a big wick on this one. What do you think? Go for it. <laughs> You're going to do it anyway? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's try it together. All right. Strike while the okay. Yep. Okay. We relight the first candle of Advent, the prophet's candle. We relight the second candle of Advent, the angel's candle. I'm number two. Uh -huh. Here we go. <laughs> we relight the third candle of Advent, the Bethlehem candle. And this morning we light the fourth candle of Advent, the shepherd's candle. Yes. Do you feel what I feel? Do you feel what I feel? Do you feel what I feel? Let us worship God. Our opening hymns number 50, rise up shepherd and follow. Shepherds were disturbed by inbreaking light. 
and glad tidings. So we make ready to leave the mundane behind and venture forth in hope to the stable of your incarnation, O Lord. And there is praise in our hearts. With sages who left behind their lesser contemplations, we suspend our everyday undertakings and place ourselves at the foot of your manger. And there is praise in our hearts. This day, earth does indeed ring with love and joy and gratitude. And we link our voices with all creation for all that Bethlehem has meant to the world and all that it still needs and at all that it may yet mean. And there is praise in our hearts. Glory, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Amen. Thank you. May you may all be seated. Having offered God our praise, let us now unite in our prayer of confession, first in unison and then in silence. Let us pray. Holy yeah. God, so it's often not. we do not feel what you feel. We do not feel the pain of a groaning creation. We do not feel the compassion that comes from the Samaritan stop. We do not feel like turning the other cheek or going the second mile. We do not feel like forgiving others. We do not feel the joy of this sacred season when the trappings are stripped away. Sometimes our hearts are so hardened that we do not seem to feel anything at all. Forgive us and have patience with us as your love melts our difficult places. Please rekindle us in the kind of love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. This love never ends, that we may begin to feel what Christ felt and continue silently. assurance of pardon. Our hope is in Christ and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured, poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are committed. Thanks be to God. Amen.
I'd like to invite that all young Christians to come forward. Is it glory? I'm not sure what we're Come up high so everybody can see you. Oh, yay! Really? <laughs> Come on up here. All right, there we go. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. Um, this morning, I brought something that we see a lot of during the Christmas season. Let's see if you can guess what it is. Rory, listen. What do you think that is? That sounds funny, doesn't it? Yeah. So, actually, what I brought was, I brought, look, is she dying to know? Bells. So your cousin gets one, and you get one, and then, whoops, oh, these are serious bells, I'm telling you. All right, and then mom gets one. Okay, there we go. All right, so hold on to your bells for just a second. Okay, we're going to ring them in a minute. All right, okay, are you ready? Everybody, wait, let me get mine. Everybody, all together now. Ring your bell. <laughs> Neat, right? Right? All right, hold your bell. All right, that, that was a happy sound. That made me feel happy hearing that sound. So the joyful sound of bells reminds us that Christmas is a happy time. It's a happy time because it's time to celebrate the birth of Jesus, the Son of God. So now look closely at your bell. Look closely at it right now. Do you know what gives that bell that joyful sound? Anybody know what makes it what makes it jingle like that? Huh? Well, if you look inside, look really, really close, you see a little ball. There's a tiny little ball in there. And every time you shake it, the ball bounces around and makes that jingle jingle sound, right? Exactly like that. And our joy comes from inside as well. It comes from having love for Jesus inside our hearts. Now, the Bible says that even though we haven't seen Jesus, we believe in him and we love him. And because of that love, we are filled with glorious joy. And that's from 1 Peter in the Bible. Now, I want you to do this now. I want you to hold your bell tightly in your hand and shake it. Like... Oh. All right. That doesn't sound the same, does it? No, it doesn't. It's not a very joyful sound anymore, is it? And our hands have dampened the sound of the bell. And it's no longer bright and joyful. It's dull and boring and lifeless. So we must be careful that we don't let anything dampen our joy at Christmas. Sometimes we get so caught up in giving gifts, going to parties, getting ready, doing everything we got to do that we miss the real joy of the season. It is important to remember that the, that the reason we go to the parties and give gifts and everything else during the season is to share the joy of Jesus's birthday. And if the gifts and the parties and all the busyness become the most important thing, then we will no longer ring out the true meaning of Christmas. Let's pray. Dear Lord, help us to clearly ring out the good news that Jesus is born. Amen.
Our first scripture lesson this morning is from the prophet Isaiah, seventh chapter, beginning with the tenth verse. Listen for and hear the word of God. Isaiah 7, 10 through 16. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as a heaven. But Haaz said to him, I do not ask, and I do not put the Lord to a test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before those two kings you are in dread will be deserted. Still learning where the button is to turn on the microphone, because I know you want to hear what I have to say. By the way, anybody who uh, wondered about that, try lighting a light, holding a child at the same time. That was a major accomplishment, I'm thinking, today. We may have already seen the daily miracle here. I'm not sure. It is good to be with you today. We're looking at Matthew's gospel. It's the first chapter. It's the piece that comes right after the thing that gets skipped all the time. There are 42 generations of what used to be called the begats, you know, and I know you really were hoping that I would read the begats today, 
but we're going to skip them. But you ought to pay attention. They're really interesting sometimes. Here's from Matthew chapter 1 at the 18th verse. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way when his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph. But before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. He said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but he had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. The grass withers, the flower fades but the word of the Lord abides forever. The word of the Lord. Pray with me, please. Holy one, so often we are in a hurry and we do race into Christmas. Please calm and quiet us now. Our hands are full of gifts that we've prepared. Please help us to empty them and open them now to receive the gift you have prepared. Our calendars are crowded with places to go, people to see. Please take us to your manger. Invite us to bend our knees. Please open your word to us and open us to your word. For it is in Christ that we pray. Amen. Well, friends. It's good to be with you again today. This is the last Sunday in the Christian season of Advent. We've been asking questions all throughout uh, the Advent season. Do you see what I see? Do you know what I know? Do you hear what I hear? The question for this Sunday is, do you feel what I feel? And honestly, it feels a little bit awkward to ask that question. I, I'm not sure you should feel what I feel. But... We're almost to Christmas, so how do you feel? Are you impatient? Uh, have you had enough of it all? <laughs> Are you ready for Christmas to have happened yesterday? Are you weary? Has your soul been so sandblasted with advertisements and sales pitches of every variety that something inside you just wants to hibernate? Are you so overwhelmed? Is there still so much to do, to bake, to buy, to wrap, to send, to make Christmas complete? Are you depressed? It's not unusual, you know, a lot of folks get depressed over the holidays, missing loved ones, simply feeling inadequate in some way, no matter how well prepared and intentioned they may be to greet the holiday, how do you feel? Perhaps you're excited, excited to get there to Bethlehem, to the destination of Christmas, excited to hear the story again, and to bask in candlelight here, and to sing hymns whose familiarity you hold, well, they hold comfort and joy. Or maybe, maybe you're a multitude of feelings. A heavenly host, if you will, of various emotions coming and going, and not necessarily in harmony. How? How do you feel? Do you feel what I feel? I'm wondering, can Bethlehem, can Bethlehem still take you by surprise? That little sound reminds us that the baby is due any day now. 
Bethlehem is just over the rise, and we're going to make it there by Saturday night, by Saturday night for sure. Just over the rise, can you see, can you see Mary and Joseph coming in your mind's eye? Speaking of surprises, did you ever wonder how they feel? You see that man? The one with the determined look coming over the rise? The one with a pregnant teenager riding on a donkey next to him? Well, that, of course, is, that's Joseph. Joseph and Mary are engaged, you know. Engaged. Do you remember how it worked back then? You didn't date and date until you found your mate. You didn't get engaged on Christmas Eve and tell the world about it on New Year's Day. Not back then. Engagement was serious business. Only the courts could break an engagement. Engagement was binding. Marriage was arranged between families long before marriage entered the minds of the young people involved, if it ever, ever entered their minds at all. Mary and Joseph may have been engaged for years. Papers were signed. Promises were made. But there's some scandal here in Matthew's story, isn't there? You see, Mary is pregnant. Talk about a surprise. His fiance is pregnant. What is Joseph to do? Matthew says that Joseph is a righteous man, a man who wants to do the right thing. But what is a righteous man to do? Here is a carpenter who has his life all lined up and his future planned out. And now his fiance is pregnant before they have lived together. And you know what that means to Joseph. This is someone else's child. Surprise. His fiance, someone else's child. What is the right thing to do? I wonder how he feels. Well, Joseph's come to a decision. The clock was ticking. He, he didn't head down to Starbucks and sit around the table and sip mocha java and ask his friends what they think he should do. He didn't tell anybody about Mary. He didn't ask everybody what they think. He will not expose Mary. He will not humiliate her. He will not disgrace her. What will he do? Well, maybe he had some friends who who would have told him, you know, what you need to do, Joseph, is open the Bible and do what Scripture has in store there. Obey the law. There are plenty of people who look at life that way. You can't go wrong if you just do what the Bible says. And some of them own a Bible that weighs about 52 pounds, and they're likely to hit you over the head with it. Do you know what the Bible says? Deuteronomy 22 says, take her out and stone her in front of the people at the entrance to her father's house, no less. What is Joseph to do? Joseph is a righteous man. He knows what the Bible says, but there is more to him than the letter of the law. He reads his Bible through the lens of love. There will be no shame for Mary, no ridicule. One New Testament professor said that Joseph was the first person in the New Testament who learned how to read the Bible. He reads it through the grace and goodness and love of the living God. He decides to handle all of this, not publicly, not legally, but quietly, <laughs> until he has a dream, a disturbingly reassuring and surprising, surprising dream. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. The child is from the Holy Spirit. You are to name him Jesus. What is this scandal? What is this scandal doing at the beginning of the gospel of Matthew? Doesn't Matthew know that this moment it might mean to people who read his story? Doesn't he see heads turning from side to side? Doesn't he anticipate the whispers and the sneers? Doesn't he know what people are going to say? Doesn't he know what people are going to think? Why doesn't Matthew just start with chapter 2? In the time of King Herod. Maybe in his own way, Matthew is extending an invitation. Maybe he's saying that his gospel will be for people who love the law 
but who need more than any law can give them in order to live fully each day. For people who find themselves in rough places of life, surprising places where there is no easy map to tell them what to do next, maybe Matthew is saying that this gospel will be about a God who won't stay locked up in anybody's laws. This gospel is about a God whose message starts with the words, do not be afraid. Maybe Matthew is saying that this gospel will be about unexpected living and even more unexpected grace. Do you think so? Does that sound like gospel to you in our day and in our time? Do you feel what I feel? Well, this is the last Sunday of Advent. The baby is due any time now. Bethlehem's just over the rise. We'll be there soon by Saturday night, Saturday night for sure. And just there, drawing nearer now, do you see, do you see also the young woman, barely more than a child and yet bearing a child? Yes, the one on the donkey. I wonder how she feels. She must be exhausted from the 90 mile journey that she's just taken. More than that, Mary is the most surprised young woman on the face of the earth. She had one foot in the grave. She was literally a stone's throw away from death. And now she's about to give life. Not only did Joseph find a way to believe in her, but apparently God believes in her too. How did Luke put it? Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. She has discovered that God believes in her, and there is no telling what might happen when you discover that God really does believe in you. How does she feel? Exhausted, relieved, surprised, hopeful, honored? They haven't decided on a name, if you can call it their decision at all. It seems to them like God's idea more than theirs. They've decided on Jesus. That's what they decided. God saves Jesus, Jesus. But Matthew has another name. Did you notice that? Matthew has another name. It's confusing. God has a name in mind. And Matthew quotes a prophecy from Isaiah, a prophecy that tells about a young woman giving birth, bearing a son, and his name is to be Emmanuel, God with us. Why does Matthew take us there? Why does Matthew start his gospel with a reference check from the greatest prophet of them all? Why doesn't Matthew just stick to Jesus and leave it at that? Well, maybe Matthew is giving us a whole new way of talking about God, relating to God, not as someone from a distant past, but as someone with us here and now. Maybe Matthew is convinced that what God is doing in history has all been leading up to this child. Maybe Matthew is telling us that, strange as it seems, in the coming of this unlikely family, the birth of this unlikely baby, something more than a miraculous birth is happening. Maybe Matthew is saying that wherever Jesus is, God is. Wherever Jesus is, God is. That unlikely as it may be, as far beyond the wildest stretch of our imagination as it may take us, in this child, God has been among us, God with us, a living God living with God's own people, showing them, showing us what it means to be faithful and what it means to breathe in grace and to live out compassion. Yeah, this is the last Sunday of Advent. Babies do any time now. Do you feel what I feel? It's an awkward question. Impatience, wonder, hope, relief, joy, exhaustion, love, confusion, determination, surprise. Can Bethlehem still take you by surprise? I have a classmate in seminary, uh, still a friend of mine all these years later. His name's Art Fogarty. He was serving a downtown congregation. He found himself tired out at the end of Advent. 
he would have called it unrighteous indignation. He was exhausted. And sometimes pastors feel like that at this time of year, you know. Listen to his story, though. There's a buzz on the office intercom. It interrupts my indignation. Someone came by to see the pastor, said the secretary. He's been here before. Someone to see the pastor. That's the office code word for someone needs help, wants a handout, is looking for rent money. I'll be right out. No, wait, it's strange. He borrowed a pen and he went outside, said he'll be back. Okay, let me know. I barely turned my back to my desk when I got beeped again. He's here. I'm on my way. Fred. Fred stood in his usual place inside the bench so he could see if and when I was coming. Fred is a relatively new addition to our regular crew of folks. We have a coterie of 10 or 12 who do their business exclusively with First Church. Fred is a nice man, a little gnome of indeterminable age, looks shorter than he really is, never completely stands up straight, always looks like he's a little afraid of something or someone might be going to hit him. And they may have hit him, I mean. He has boxer's ears, little crooked petals of cauliflower on the other side of his head. Fred is always friendly, always polite, never hassles any of the office staff. He's shy, just a hint of an impish gleam in his eye. And sometimes Fred comes with Edith, his wife. Mostly he comes alone, but he always shows up in need like all the rest, always wanting something. Most of the time, I don't mind trying to help. Lord knows I would not want to be in their shoes or their homes or their lives. The very few who lie, who try to take advantage, seldom have ever come back. Most of the routine returnees try very hard not to abuse the privilege. But the parade of the indigent had gone on nonstop since Thanksgiving, and I was hardly feeling like Father Christmas. And here, one more time, was someone looking for something, asking much, giving little, one more palm in the sea of outstretched hands that I had encountered everywhere from the department stores to Church Street. Morning, Fred. What can I do for you? Nothing, preacher. Just came by to see you. Edith peered from around the corner. Hello, Edith. Is there something you need? In my heart, I knew they always needed something. No, sir. We just brought you this. And Fred reached back to Edith, who handed him a white cardboard cake box. And I stared at the top, at the carefully drawn open letters that had obviously been sketched with that borrowed pen to Arthur F. Fogarty, Merry Xmas from Edith and Fred Johnson family. I opened the box. A pastry about eight inches wide grinned at me from the bottom of the box. We got lemon, said Fred. We thought you'd like that. The pastry was wrapped in plastic. It occurred to me that Fred knew someone in my position probably wouldn't consider eating anything given him by someone in his position if it didn't look surgically sterile. We got him to wrap it up, preacher. We wanted it to be fresh. Fred, I don't know what to say. Nothing, preacher. Edith and I are just grateful for everything you do for us. God bless you and Merry Christmas. And they were gone. I don't know exactly how long I stood there, but after a while, the amazement wore off enough to allow my, my legs to move. And I walked down the whole hallway holding a $1.25 pastry given to me by a man who probably didn't have 50 cents to his name. And as I turned the corner to my study, all at once, it was Christmas. Bethlehem took me by surprise. And I broke into a tune I hadn't sung since I was a little boy. 
Mary had a baby, yes, Lord. Mary had a baby, yes, my Lord. Mary had a baby, yes, Lord. The people keep a coming and the train's done gone. Call the baby Jesus, yes, Lord. Call the baby Jesus, yes, my Lord. Call the baby Jesus, yes, Lord. The people keep a coming and the train's done gone. Laid him in the manger, yes, Lord. Do you feel what I feel? The affirmation of Advent, Emmanuel, God with us and God for us. For God so loved the world and loves it still that he sent Jesus to be with us. Mary had a baby. Do you feel what I feel? I feel blessed. I feel blessed. Amen. As you are able, would you please stand with me and affirm our faith using the words from 1 John? Well, from John 1. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace, truth. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father. And from his fullness we have we all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. And I believe the Bonnie's going to come around now. We share our joys and concerns together. She'll have the microphone. And if you'd like us to pray about something or someone, just wave at her and she'll come running. Well... I don't know about running, but Sh Sharon in the back had her hand up for a second there, Bonnie. Um, I just want to thank the congregation for the generous gift they, they blessed me with today. And I also want continued prayers for my nephew, Brett Gruber, who um, has just left the hospital for the second time. He um, is now able to use a wheelchair and for the first time be able to go to the bathroom by himself uh, after a serious motorcycle car accident that he had. And he's had several surgeries on his leg and bone graft and skin grafts and would like to pray us just for his continued healing. Um, a joy that our oldest grandson Graduated yesterday. <laughs> Are there others? The chief bell ringer. More like dingling. Um, <laughs> I'd just like to um, thank. Uh, Ellen Bristol for all that she has uh, 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 given to our our choir. Um, she uh, comes and and joins in, and she um, blesses us with lots of other things that you'll hear. So, um, uh, and her daughter, um, we know her as Munchkin, but that's <laughs> but that's uh, jo Joanna Skokel. And, um, and Jean Weaver, who uh, you all know, um, and she has uh, dubbed in for us and, and it, it makes it so uh, much better. Uh, rather than we have two bells, we have a, a, a group of bells. So thank you. And, and to all of the bell ringers, they are so faithful. Thank you. Are there any others? It is good 
to be Christian and to be in community together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, we do ask you to receive our thanks and praise. Please draw us deeper into the holiness of this season, even as we approach the place of stable and stars and shepherds. Grant us grace as this Advent season closes to be as patient with others as you are patient with us, to be as forgiving with others as we would have them be with us, to be as giving to life as Christ himself was giving. In these days of an ever-increasing pace and so many worthless anxieties, draw us deeper into your way of living. <laughs> Teach us the beauty of simplicity and the glory of gentleness. Please teach us the joys of compassionate service. Teach us the same tenderness with which you have embraced our shortcomings. In this season so filled with mixed messages and variable values, draw us deeper into your truth. Set our hearts on eternal things in all seasons. Set our minds on pursuits that prove worthy over time. Set our souls on the life and kingdom we've come to know in Christ. Please be with those among us in special need at this time. We do give you thanks for the continued healing of a young man now out of the hospital and able to use a wheelchair. We pray for those who will miss loved ones for the first time this Christmas. We pray for those who are facing surgery and uncertainty. We pray for those in the tightening grasp of any illness. We pray for those looking to provide and unable to figure out how. And with those who are stretched beyond apparent endurance, we pray for those who drown in doubt and in citizen. And finally, oh Lord, we thank you so much for the celebrations of music for Ellen, Joanna Munchkin, Jean, and all of our singers and ringers. And for graduations of grandsons and the other celebrations that mark the days and fill us with joy and memory. Please draw all of us deeper into Advent, closer to the Christ of Christmas, who still teaches us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Let us continue our worship of God with the presentation of our tithes and offerings and the Christmas joy offering.
join me with a prayer of unison of dedication. Loving God, we present ourselves in love. Tender God, give us comfort to the lonely. Almighty God, let us bear your strength to the weak. Healing God, let our gifts bear your compassion. Let our lives echo your loving purpose made known in Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, our closing hymn, it seems very appropriate to have the word ring in this hymn today. And I promised Ellen that I would make sure you all knew, so we were sing, singing it the same. It's E day O when you get to singing that, not I day O, not I day O, it's E day O. And it's probably good to know that that means therefore, therefore glory to God in the highest. Let's unite our voices in hymn number 46. And Ellen's gonna play it through one time. So we get the two. invitations before we have the benediction. One is to come and join us right after worship. Uh, there's a lovely spread. I've never seen shrimp out there. At a, uh, that's pretty good. And lots of people have put time and effort in to make it special for all of you. And then come and join us on Christmas Eve at seven o'clock as we celebrate Christ's birth together with candlelight and with great joy and song. And now, Christian friends, 
Go out in God's world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all persons. Love and serve the Lord rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Rest and abide with you and with those you love and with those you need to love, now and always. Amen.